Hello world, I'm Del Hussein and this is the Wow Mind. Today I'm at the headquarters of Van Dan Dand and I'm with Simon Brown, a cultural innovator, really. You have been looking at fashion, you've been looking at design, you've been looking at architecture, you've been involved with music, you've been involved with film, and just creative pursuits. And I think your um, influence has gone from here to Eastern Europe into um, Los Angeles. What would you describe how you began out doing? Well, originally I started um, art directing magazines and just wanted to produce graphic design that represented the culture of the time. And whether that was music um, or whether that was fashion, it was the same thing, really. So the, the magazine format was really, for my generation, was that's where you go and read about cool stuff either the fanzine or anything. And I didn't really realise at the time, but that's what made me realise culture is where I want to be and how I want to, or how I want to communicate with individuals. It's not until now that actually I've tied up all the loose ends and put them together and realised as a graphic designer, you don't have to be limited to one format. And I think that's what I've successfully achieved is crossing all of those boundaries hmm. from Originally, I cut a, my degree course, and we haven't spoken about this, but I cut dub plates of uh, people's opinions, and it was called Silent Voices. But I went and literally looked in the yellow pages and picked out people that I just wanted to talk to and ask them one question, what was on your mind? And most, a lot of people said very little, but there was a few nuggets of really wild inspiration, and then I cross-pollinated that with really successful people from... Uh, actually from the rave scene, who gave their opinion about what was going on. And it was really lovely to hear these voices come together. And I put that to one side, and now I'm actually most probably in all essence going back to that idea of communicating other people's agendas, and now even more so my own. Amazing. So when I look at what you do, Sai, you are... I suppose you're, you're taking the idea of um, identity, of culture, of even celebrity a little bit, really. Yes. And you're, you're saying, I'm going to take all of that stuff aside and I'm going to move it aside and I'm going to embody it into uh, an ampersand sign, into an and sign. Yep. And, and what you've, I think uh, in the discussion I had with you before, you said to me, well, look, if you think about it, just even 10, 15 years ago, you didn't really think of the at sign, yeah. you know, and now it's in everything. It's so important, really. If you want to get on the internet, you need at somewhere. It's a destination. But then and is also in there. And whilst you're not necessarily trying to parody the two, you're trying to say, well, look, this is a close association that brings things together. Well, I, th I think... At, tw at 21, I started the company and with another creative who's a guy called John Link, and we came up with a name, and the name was came out of working with Rem Callhouse, and it came out of the fact that we A, needed a name because it was going to go on the front cover of the book, and we didn't want to call ourselves something like Link and Brown because that just sounds weird. Um, so we stuck with and and and, which came out f out of an architect and a lift, a very famous architect now, using that terminology all the time. And we looked at it and we said, well, if we're English, we would say et cetera, et cetera. But and 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 is the summation of the European version of being together. There's never an end to it, and that and that you can collaborate. So it's always in an idea. There's always and and it's everywhere it communicates and joins so many things together as well as being this mo so it's like this multi hyphen anyway and if we were to be graphic designers what better than the 27th letter of the alphabet which it's formerly was to go well Brilliant. actually we are designers we've got now we now actually have a symbol instead of 
uh, uh, just a name we've actually got a logo type that actually is identifiable and then we can have ownership over it as creatives but we can also let it go because it belongs to everyone else right so when you take something like that and you i mean initially you got that as an identity and you thought well look, this is a unique identity that's not owned yeah and i will uh, add it to my company and your company did really well. Um, you were doing work with BT. You're doing work with Vodafone. Yes. You're doing work with lots of big brands. Um, and you were doing work with, I think, some stunning design leaders, yep. like Rem Coolhouse that you mentioned. Um, now, all of that, you were building their culture and you were looking what they're about, reinterpreting it into something almost before the web started yeah and 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 giving ideas for creative outlet bordering on when i look at your books and you produce lots of books um when i look at your books the the bordering on um anarchy really they they're really um throw caution to the wind about following any kind of like set format and you yeah and some of them are definitely a period of time where they are fundamentally a prototype in their own sense. Even though they were a finalised product, they were kind of had that feeling of feeling unfinished, which I think was a period of time. And I think it was it was a look and feel. But they are anarchic. And I'll, if you right. go through the front cover of who's on the front cover, there's uh, George Bush with Freedom Fries. There's Jesus with a SARS mask. There's Saddam Sam and Sam Rambo. Yeah and uh, Kim Jong-il as a Terminator. Um, so it's quite insane when you think this is perverted architecture for Rem Coolhouse, um, <laughs> and one of the most influential architectural practices in the world, I'd say. Well, that influence does influence younger architects and younger designers generally. And one in particular is um, a guy called Virgil. Yes. And Virgil, from what I understand, is now the creative director of Louis Vuitton. Yes, he's menswear creative director. And But he's an architect to begin with, yeah? Yes, I think they classify him as a multi-hyphenate. Multi-hyphenate. cover every single genre, but with elaborate beauty to it. And collaborates with everyone that you could imagine that you'd want to collaborate with. And he's now... Um, He's become a style icon in himself. He's got his own brand. Um, he replaced, I think, the former Louis Vuitton uh, head of design. Yeah, so Mark Jacobs was before him, and then Virgil has come on board. Wow, big shoes to fill. Big, big shoes to fill. But I think he's doing it amazingly well, and especially the way the world is changing, I think you couldn't want for a better person to be in that position. Because he's also involved with Kanye West. Uh, he has been involved with Kanye West. I'm not so sure what their involvement is now, um, but I think they're always going to be doing stuff together. They're both on the same level playing field. The reason I bring him up, because he had your book, this book that you did with Rem, uh, in his backpack. Yes. So, so that was an influence on him. So Virgil, this year, so I ended up producing. So Virgil had a exhibition held at the MCA, which is now a travelling exhibition. So it's the Museum of Contemporary Art. And it's an exhibition called The Fig Figures of Speech. And that exhibition was a celebration of Virgil's work across all of his disciplines, everything from collaborations with artists to his own independent work as well. And that would be uh, the 10 trainers that he dropped with Nike, including a limited edition that he did at the MCA. Uh, I believe he did some work with David Ajay. I mean, the list is just endless. And I got involved with him because they needed a book that went along with the exhibition. And and he thought, this guy's done Rem's book. He's the guy I want. Well, it wasn't just he's the guy I want. It was, and this is where I really appreciate his understanding and concepts of the world is it's all about collaboration so he unlike anyone else he decided to have three agencies all working together which are completely celebrated um and we worked with or i worked with two other agencies to make this book a reality and you could not do it in any other way in some sense because someone had to unlock his hard drives 
have access to his work, then do all of the print production for the book and then have creative input to it. So my involvement ended up being the creative direction and or creative cons consultation, whatever, however you want to call it. And that led on to actually not just the book, but actually releasing a collection with him. So if a fashion designer, there's going to be a show, you expect that there's going to be merch and there was merch. And I was privileged to be in amongst other artists um, like Futura, Tom Sachs, who also did collaborations with me and released trainers, t-shirts, hoodies, and I did the same and massive respect to him. Brilliant. So you've taken this idea um, and you're being, you're being called upon when you do this. But why I said a little bit earlier, anarchy is because I think what you've been doing is exploring stuff. So talk to me, I know, Simon, you went around and behind us here is an and sign crudely cut in polystyrene. What's this all about? Yeah, it's first off, this, tip. this won't matter Put it the right way podcast. Around. It's a bit squeaky, maybe you can hear it. Sometimes it talks, so it doesn't really. But the, uh, essentially this way around. So the idea was I had an opportunity to go and be part of something that was really magical, and I thought, actually, I'll bring my own magic to a part of New York. And I thought, actually, if I have my own logo and it's an and, why is the and never represented? So I wanted to do the biggest representation I ever could for an and as a type designer and also someone that believes in this collaborative process. So I posed a question and I posed a question to Instagram saying, can I have an and in my username? Because actually digitally you it's an impossibility which makes it even funnier um so i carved an and i a human sized and and i took it as a piece of sculptural graffiti that was if i'm going to go with my logo my logo is going to be as big as everyone else's and be part of something and it's going to be the size of a piece of graffiti that actually i leave at the end so I went to New York and I travelled around and I met hundreds of people and in New York I had people say, and what? And they started shouting at me and it was wonderful to have a retort back with people that was spontaneous or I actually went to the Ampersand bar and I sat down and had a pint with my aunt and then spoke to loads of people and loads of creatives. And since then, what I've realised, and if you go on my Instagram, you'll see that 50% of the content that I post is actually not my content. It's other people that have become part of this family or a movement, however you want to call it. And they've shared their own ideas and shared it back with me. And I've really shared it back out to them. And I think that echo chamber is a really wonderful thing. But I left at Instagram, I left an and for them in their head office just to let them know because they hadn't responded to any of my direct messages. I thought I'll carve them an and and give it to them. So it's, it started with that, but it's actually a much bigger question than that. And the question is, why do we all spend so much time on our mobile phones? If we're all in this together, why are we so locked into believing that we are trying to live our lives through other people? So if we, if we are trying to achieve that, why are we not talking to each other? So walking around with this and I spoke with, let's say I made a hundred people that I met and I've documented everyone that I spoke to and I actually made a newspaper in the end and I sent that newspaper out to 500 people at Christmas hmm. and the responses I got was amazing. Again, if you go on Insta, you can see that newspaper and where it ended up. Hmm. Um, and it was just fas fascinating to see what a logo, a brand logo, how far it could go and what good it could bring the world. But the question is if, we are going to spend this much time isolated, which we have done in COVID-19. We really need to be at the point where we're actually communicating with people or sharing ideas. And that's why I did it. Fantastic. So you've used this identity and I think it's becoming quite cult status like because people are now copying it and they're copying it a little bit in fashion. They're copying it a little bit in graphics. They're putting it onto Instagram shots. They're doing their own versions. Yeah. So you're becoming a little, you're getting a bit of a cult following. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's a collection that's based, a fashion collection that's based on, on the kind of and, and it now transpires that actually I, I had a fashion collection 
that went with it. So I had a bucket hat, I had um, a scarf and a piece of knitwear. And that those items generated a look and a feel and that look and feel was quite subversive in some ways. And the shots that I went and took and documented it were getting on top of buildings, perceivably doing things that might have been seen to be a bit tricky. But yeah, that was, it was good times. And I think people are, are involved in it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you, it's interesting you said it's a bit subvertive. What what kind of image were you trying to give? Or was it an image? Or, you know, what angle were you going for? What ex, What feedback were you expecting? So I always think it's hard when you... I don't necessarily want someone to look at me and to understand me. I've always been someone that is sits back slightly from the crowd so i'm not someone that's actually you might not notice me and this was actually an opportunity to go actually yeah i wanted to be noticed i want to be part of these things and changing having the fashion that's what changed me and i was like actually this is where i always wanted to be and i'm sure there's loads of other people who want this as well you know we all want to when you're 12 15 and you listen to rap or whatever you might be listening to whatever you're into you'd be like i want to wear that i want to look like that guy off slipknot or whatever it might be and you might, might dress up like that in your bedroom until your parents go you're not going out like that <laughs> this was the opportunity where i could go out like that and then inspire other kids that could go yes this is something that is brilliant like it's just something that catches my imagination and i can bring something to the party so with with uh, this idea, you you've been now you've incorporated it within fashion. You've got your own fashion range, and people are buying you. They buy you online as well. Yep, it's available. And um, what is the next step for Simon? As this as this almost, I mean, one of the books I was looking at a little earlier, Simon, you had pretty much every British iconic artist and design leader there uh, you know and it's a book you put together for um the serpentine gallery i think yes that's correct yeah um so you're clearly in that club of elite but you're you're also part of um i would say you're not trying to go for the mainstream you're you're slightly offshoots you're almost a david lynch version you know so it's strange, but people ask me and they say, well, now you're doing fashion. And I actually see it as not just doing fashion. I see it as producing actually objects that are based from really solid ideas and as ideas that are actually going to um, inspire cultural change within society. And I think some of it is questioning. So ch having change on a uh, uh, Forcing change to happen does not mean that you walk out the door and club someone over the head and say, you must believe in this. It can be quite subtle in a way that you actually question why society is a certain way. And then you lead people to raise their own questions and believe, why, why, why is it actually like this? Or why, why, is, it, why is things changing? Like, or what should, why should we be thinking in a certain way? So... My idea is actually to take the company, produce items, whether you call them objects or items, it doesn't really matter, but produce those and produce those to the extent that they become collectibles. And the and will be a big part of that. Take those and drop those into society as a nugget for change. So if you're, um, you're now looking at the future, what does the future hold for Simon? What is it that you want to do next? What would be your goal going forward? Because the, the way I see it is you're in the heart of a time, the London, if I can call it this, the London Shoreditch time, and you probably embody all of that in the way that the Manchester scene embodied um, Oasis. I think as an artist, this this time that we're in now of um, London, East London, um, becoming very iconic around the world. I mean, I was in Shanghai and um, 
I was in a restaurant in Shanghai and it was, you know, somebody came to me and I said, they said, where are you from? I said, oh, London. And they said, oh, Shoreditch. <laughs> and I thought, how weird of all the places, not Knightbridge, Knightsbridge, not Buckingham Palace, not Arabs, Shoreditch. And I said, why do you say Shoreditch? He said, because that's the coolest thing coming out of London now. You know, and it's because it's a cultural identity that people can align with. And it's about reuse and change, you know, the change of um, maybe an area that's been run down, rejuvenated, reborn. And with it, find, finding new identity. So out of a personal take, really, and where I would see myself in the future, and where I'd love to be is... I would love to help build a collective of people together. And however you call it, you might call it a gang, you might call it a group, you might call it a gaggle, however you describe it, it doesn't really matter. I'd like to have a group of people that work together collectively on building ideas that are going to change the world for the future. Brilliant. And what that means is hopefully I won't have to turn up to freeze with another with my own artwork, which was a giant and so I took my own piece of art to freeze and then left it there for them. I, I should just say to people, I know we've talked an awful lot about and, but actually you're, you've done amazing visual graphic work, really. And um, there's so much stuff that you've done to just build other people's brands. You've been building brands for, I don't know, 15 years now and making them look really radical in some instances. When you did Vodafone, um, and Vodafone are as corporate as you can get. They're a super corporate company. Yeah, so we did a, we did a magazine for them, and we had the ability of complete freedom. At the beginning when we pitched that job, I pitched a cross-dresser on the front cover. Uh, this a guy. cross dresser on the front of Vodafone. Yeah, see, I mean, he was wearing a nice pinstripe suit, but it was pretty out there, seeing as though it was 2004. And this was, this was also in the Czech Republic, so it's Eastern European country. So I can't see where I don't think they. Two years into the project, I did a sex issue with a cross dresser on the front cover, and it had a sealed section that was all in fluoro, and it was given away freely in stores, and that issue dropped and disappeared in the first week and it'd need to be there for a month yeah. so you can come up with something radical it does take time to get it past people but yes that's what i've done for people over the years and some of them some of the big wins have been not for radical clients it's been for very conservative clients winning something that you think this is madly rad radical for them, like it's off the radar if you can get something past a very, very conservative person. Working for the Serpentine, if they're yeah. not radical, why are they an art gallery? Yeah. What things grab you? What things would you like to change? And what, what is that change? What is the change that you want to see? What is the change that you feel creativity can help? So I think, uh, I think if you look at, if you look at anonymity and you look at what Vex Generation did with their fashion and how they, the idea of concealing their own faces, which let's face it, it's always quite appealing to a young audience anyway. It makes you feel slightly naughty. But actually the, the, what they were addressing was that the, the way we are all surveillanced in society and how much that, that kind of covers ourselves. So, there is one piece that I am one piece of fashion that I am going to drop, which is a cross between uh, a balaclava and a bandana, and it fully covers your face as a veil, and it crosses so many boundaries of why should you cross your face, and it doesn't answer what it is or who it is, but I think it, it's a cool piece of fashion that people are going to wear, but it definitely challenges. Why are we all being surveilled? How can all of our cultures exist anyway as a society together? And should we be that more accepting and not judge people by face value? If you can't see someone's face, then you never judge someone. I mean, that's really interesting because it also borders into 
faith in general, really, and um, the whole idea of, because there's two things in this one, there's like hijabs on the one side, yes. where there's an argument that, the you know, Europe doesn't particularly like having hidden identity. On the other side, now people are wearing masks, obviously, because of the climate that we're in. Yep. So people are kind of covered, even if they don't want to be covered. Um, with that in mind, do you think this starts to to approach some of that? Do you think people's ideas to being partially veiled uh, changes their outlook on, on society or people? Is it not an infringement of civil liberties? I mean, that's one thing that I was listening to on the radio this morning about that civil liberties. And I think it's just such a strange time that if we don't raise questions about it right now, like how much you use your mobile phone and the whole TikTok thing, about surveillance is just like wow we're giving away our faces and our identity every day why are we giving it away and what should we be doing it's not me dictating what it is it's me saying that at least be aware that this stuff exists do you think people are giving it away because are we a kim kardashian generation does everybody just want to be famous every young person want to be on tiktok and they're demonstrating how successful they are by the number of likes they have. Is that what it is? Are we are we that vulnerable? Is is our kids that vulnerable? I'd say absolutely. So so what you're doing, if I can interpret it, taking the new fashion item you're doing, is kind of a statement against vulnerability or the need to feel visible all the time. Yep. Need to okay. Um but then you can put anything you want on it. So yeah, there's there's multiple versions of it, multiple graphic versions of it, and I think I'm going to drop five different designs, which means you know the well, I might even eventually drop limited edition ones, single one-offs. Um, but the one thing that I'll definitely do is anyone that buys into this stuff is they're going to receive limited editions. So there will only ever be a very, very small select few of these made. And fundamentally, they're a piece of fashion, but they're a piece of art in their own right. Mm -hmm. But in your in your community of designers, I know you've done a lot of collaborations and you, you across the board with all kinds of people from different countries, different continents. Yep. Um, and so I think that's what makes it wonderful. Is there a difference between the design ideologies based on different continents or is creativity creativity? Can it just be radical from anywhere? So I don't know whether creativity is always radical. There's one, yeah. one thing. Yeah. Um, so, and I don't know how you can actually be radical given that most of the things that are done are already done. done. Yeah. <laughs> So either you're going to be an interpretation of something else or an amalgamation of different things. Um, so I just, I think it's really sad sometimes when previously I've gone to work in countries across Europe and they've looked at design from London as being above them or something to be aspired to and the reality is once you start digging around you find that every single culture has this extraordinary graphic language that might not be appreciated by the generation before and i think the whole global phenomenon of design and creativity being put at the forefront a lot of localized creativity is been ignored especially in, you know in in eastern europe that's definitely the case slovenia i've worked in uh, the czech republic and i found amazing designers there and i just kind of missed missed that point because i think that it, although there is this global economy i think there is a localized thing too as well and that needs to shine ever more um have you got more ambitions to go out there? Do you see yourself doing more work with these people in the States? Is that the plan? Is that the grand plan for AND? I'd love to work in the States. Yeah, I think the States has 
I've never, I, actually, I never wanted to go there. So I had no, no reason to go there. And I thought, okay, I'll go to a conference. And I went to a conference to educate myself about a term that is either loved or hated and it's streetwear. So I went to the biggest convention that's out, one of the biggest conventions which run by Complex gone out there. And what I saw was the mix between music, fashion, cars, the gumball rally, the people that run that, the skateboard. It was a scene and basically what it was like was taking every single Instagram that you follow that you think is wild and chucking it in a room and just, it was like acid. It was brilliantly explosive. And there's nothing that exists like that here. And people, the people that I met were massively open to wearing alternative clothes. And it's not that I want to produce streetwear, but it did feel like a connection between a home. And I know it's going to come here and I know it's influencing fashion wear here as well, more than anything. And especially, especially because of Virgil, although whether streetwear dies, or whatever, it's a, it's a culture that is a young person's culture. And I think it's fascinating to see how it crosses over between music, art. I mean, what, what fashion fair do you go to and you see high end pottery produced with rap music, death row records playing next to Adidas with a Timberland store, a Kappa store, some guy with a great big hand and, you know, a couple of amazing bands playing. Brilliant. On that, I'm going to, uh, we need to do this more because I want to see where this goes yep. in the future. Yeah. And I want to see where you're going to go. Well, look, thank you for doing this. This is, uh, really, it's a dialogue to talk to, to just people doing things what you're trying to do out here simon is uh, establish um, an identity a brand which is really off the wall and it's really caught an imagination of what i'd say a creative community and um i think taking that uh, there are two ways you can go with it and one way certainly that you can go with it is to really push it and push the creativity side and, and really, because if you don't, then I think you'll be, you'll be frustrated and it needs to have that hard push. You know, I can see it. And when I look at the people that recognize you, for example, um, you know, you work with OMA, Rem Coolhouse, the biggest name in architecture, really. He's up there. He's one of the top three, four big names in the world. And he's, constantly you know he's on your speed dial you're doing work with him books with him organizing exhibitions with him and um, he sees what you do and then you're doing the stuff in LA you're doing all your stuff that you're doing in London music fashion I mean it's kind of endless and it's really you're you're on a journey and it's really a quest to see when you feel a certain amount of peace of where that journey is going to take you yep you know that's a good piece of advice. <laughs> yeah, you just got to keep going. And I'll keep you along posted on the whole journey. Thank you. Well, I'd like you to. Um, thank you, Simon, so much for this. This My is pleasure. one of our early, early talks, but in a couple of years' time, uh, we'll be doing another one of these. Fantastic. Cheers, Simon. Thank you very much. Yeah.